Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Take out your Bible tonight and turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to hopefully finish up tonight the, this lesson series on the Sermon on the Mount. I show the elders, I have 69 pages of typed notes for the Sermon on the Mount. I said I, I didn't mean to do it, but I kind of have a book uh, on the Sermon on the Mount that, that, that's good for me. I'll be able to refer to it a little bit later. I just want to, as we did last week, kind of back up a little bit, catch up a little bit of speed and kind of bring you back in. You know, it's Wednesday. Wednesday's the middle of the week. Do you know when most of the accidents happen at work? 10 o'clock on Wednesdays. Because it's the middle of the day and the middle of the week. And they say that's usually when people get a little bit lax and they get a little bit tired. So when you come into church on Wednesday night, I know you're not coming in like you usually do on Sunday morning and you're ready to go and you're, you got all this energy. Look at you now. You just look like rejects from a Geritol commercial, you know. You all just kind of there, you know. That, that's what I have to turn the camera on them once and see what I got to work with. You think it's bad looking at me, you ought to look back. And I tell you, um, I, I just kind of want to get get you caught up a little bit, bring us back up to speed with where we were. I hope you've been learning from this. I hope you've been learning from the Sermon on the Mount. You know, this, this, is, this is one of the greatest, greatest assets that we have is actually have Jesus' sermon printed in front of us. Back in chapter 6, in verse 33, Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. How do we miss that? Why do we miss that? Why do we structure our life in such a way that we put ourselves first and we put our agenda first and our priorities first ahead of the things of God? When Jesus promises us that if we put him first, he is going to take care of us. He's going to take care of all of those other things. We have either not read our Bible enough to have found that verse of Scripture or we just really don't believe what Jesus said. The very first sermon that Jesus preached that was recorded in the Bible is here in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. He covers in this sermon nearly everything that you and I need to know about being a Christian and living the Christian life. Jesus himself tells us how we are to live and how we're to act and how we are to react in nearly every situation imaginable. And yet the majority of people in the church seem to know little or nothing about what Jesus said in these three chapters. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. We claim to be a Christian, but we seem to know very little about what Jesus said. We know very little about the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we may know the Beatitudes because somebody taught those to us when we were a child. But what else do we know about this Sermon on the Mount? What else do we know about it? What other verses can we quote? Are we, why are we so negligent? Why are we so ignorant of this? If these are Jesus' words on what God expects from all of us, why are we not experts on this sermon? Why are we not experts on, on Jesus' sermon? Go home tonight and read it. Get up tomorrow, read it again. And keep on reading it until all of, the, all of it sinks in and, and it becomes a part of who you are. You will definitely become a better Christian if you do it. Because you're reading what Jesus says. Now, I can understand somewhat when you forget what I preach. You know, <laughs> I, every now and then, you know, I'll say to my wife, no, what did I preach last Sunday? Now, she's my wife. She can get away with this. She'd go, I don't know. Sin was wrong, you know, something like that, you know. 
I, I don't necessarily blame you for that because sometimes I forget what I preach from week to week. Uh, not because it wasn't profitable or because it wasn't from God, but because once I'm done preaching one sermon, my mind and my spirit already moves on to the next. Already this week, the first three days of this week, I've already worked on two sermons and a lesson plan. And I get to tell you right now, if you look close, you can see my brain oozing out of one of my ears here. You can only think so much. Throw in on top of that, we're working on Journey Through Time, and, and I'm sitting there, we're editing, uh, editing the, the, the recordings and all of that stuff, and, and, so, and so my mind is, is pretty well putty, so I'm not going to remember a whole lot. I might not remember I was even here tonight. Um, but I'm not too offended if you forget what I preach. But why don't we remember what Jesus preached? Some printing companies have, have even taken the initiative to put Jesus' words in red letters. God himself is speaking to us in an audible voice through Jesus Christ. So why don't we pay more attention to what he said? That's why we're studying it tonight. If every member of my congregation would become well-versed on the Sermon of the Mount, my job would become a lot easier. The church would function more efficiently, more ministry would get done, more people would be saved, more needs would be met, more prayers would be answered. But sadly, the bulk of the people in the church, as good as they are, still have no idea about the things that Jesus taught in this sermon. Seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Before we do anything else, before we try anything else, before we make the mistakes, before we go the wrong way, before we take the wrong route and we trip and fall along the way, why don't we just seek him first? Rule number one, he says, put God first. Commandment number one says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you don't get that one right, you're going to struggle with everything else because you break any of the other before you break any of the other commandments you have to first break the first commandment you have to put something before god so why don't we seek god first the answer is obvious our focus is not on god but our focus is on ourselves we're encouraged to do that today we are encouraged to think about ourselves. It's the way our society grooms us. It's the way the world grooms us. Think about yourself, Fergus. Our, our, our focus is on our time. Our focus is on our money and our health and our future and our agenda without giving a second thought to the things of God. Now, you can talk religious. A lot of people do. You can sing the songs and shout amen and say hallelujah. You can put on the dog and fool the people that are sitting next to you in the pew into believing that you have your act together. But God knows your heart. And someday God will expose your selfish heart to the very situations that Jesus spoke of in this sermon. We're somehow convinced that if we put God first and ourself last, that we will never have the life that we desire. We have to look out for number one. We have to take care of business. But Jesus promises us that the bonus is when we seek God first and when we put what he wants ahead of what we want, he promises to add to our life all of those other things. If you want to do life your way, then you will worry and you'll be angry and you'll be depressed and you'll experience all of those negative, life-draining emotions. But if you do life God's way, it'll all work out just like it's supposed to. You'll find the satisfaction and the peace and the joy that you were seeking and unable to find when you were doing it all wrong. We're now going to move on to Chapter 7. That gets us caught up to date. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. What makes this passage so difficult to understand is the meaning of the word judgment. 
The word judgment can have two meanings here in the Scriptures. It can mean discerning, which is weighing or seeking to know the truth about something, or it can mean passing sentence, deciding payment and reward or condemnation. When we look at the whole passage, it's clear that Jesus isn't talking about discernment here. The meaning is very plain. He doesn't prohibit the civil judgment of the courts on evildoers because this is approved throughout all of the Bible. He he doesn't prohibit the judgment of the church through the church's officers upon those who walk disorderly, for both he and the apostles supported this. He doesn't forbid the private judgments that we're compelled to form towards those who do wrong because Jesus himself tells us that we are to judge men by their fruits. What Jesus prohibits here is rash, unloving judgments, a fault-finding spirit, a, a disposition to condemn without examination of the charges. So he says, judge not. People use this all the time. Don't judge me. The Bible says you shouldn't judge me. But they have no idea what Jesus was talking about here. He's referring to a rash and unjust judgment. Christ doesn't condemn us for forming an opinion of the conduct of other people because it's impossible to not form an opinion of conduct when we know that conduct is evil. If I see you walk out of here and shoot somebody and take their billfold, I'm not judging you when I say you killed that person and stole from them. But what Jesus refers to here is the habit of forming a judgment hastily, harshly, and without any allowance for every circumstance, and a habit of expressing that opinion harshly and unnecessarily. There was a gentleman that used to attend here a few years ago. His wife attended another church. Uh, His wife had gone into the hospital, but... I didn't find out about it till a couple of days later. I always tell people, when you go to the hospital, please let me know. Please let me know. If you want me to visit, please let me know. Don't, they don't say, well, I told the volunteer. The volunteer calls three, four days later if they call at all. His wife went into the hospital, and as soon as I found out of it, uh, uh, immediately I called him on the phone and I asked how she was doing. He no more than answered the telephone when he began to light into me about how terrible of a pastor I was. I hadn't been to the hospital to see his wife. Evidently, I found other things to be more important than the needs of my congregation. And he went on and on telling me what a horrible excuse of a pastor I was. It happens. What he didn't know was that my mother had fallen and she was in the hospital. I was spending my days at the hospital and spending my nights staying with my dad. My two granddaughters were living with me and Lisa, and Lisa's brother was dying from cancer, and we were making trips to Fort Wayne every other day. His timing was really poor, and I did something that I don't ordinarily do. I exploded on him. I told him that I had a life, and I had a family too. I told him what was going on in my life, and I wasn't very nice about it. At first, there was total silence on the other end. I thought maybe he'd hung up. And then he spoke up, and he apologized. And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. And I said, no, you didn't know that, and you should be sorry. You didn't know that. I told my wife, I said, I've never took that approach before, but maybe I'll use it more often because this guy turned right around and we got really friendly with me all of a sudden. You see, that was the kind of rash judgment that Jesus was talking about. Quick condemnation without any knowledge of the facts. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? We're quick to judge other people, especially in this age of cell phones and Facebook and Twitter. In the age of talk shows and fast food news, we form an opinion and we pronounce judgment in a matter of seconds. It's the violation of the law of love. The argument against it is that you be not judged. Don't judge this way, or you're going to be judged that way. Your own character and your actions will be pronounced on with the same severity in the day of God's judgment that you have used on other people. What Jesus is saying is here, you set the standard for which you will be judged. 
Someday you're going to stand before God to give account for your life, and you may be condemned by your own words. Go ahead and judge. Just keep in mind the standards that you use on other people, God's going to use on you. Jesus illustrates this point with the example of the splinter and the beam. The comparison of the two objects is blatantly obvious. One's far greater than the other. One is way bigger than the other. But isn't that typically the case? Do we not sometimes pick at the tiny sins of other people while ignoring that giant sin that we have in our own life? We condemn somebody openly because of their public sin when there are giant skeletons hanging in our own closet that if somebody found out, we would be even more guilty. An old lady came into a church service, walked right down to the front. She sat down the front row, and the pastor noticed she, in one hand, she had her Bible. The other hand, she had a spittoon. She sat down, laid her Bible in her lap, put the spittoon on the floor, reached into her purse, dug out, put a wad of something into her mouth, and began to chew. Well, the preacher said the more that he preached, the harder he preached, the faster she chewed and began to spit into the spit too. He said, then I started picking on things. He said, I thought I'd get to her. He said, it's a sin to smoke that tobacco. And she would chew and spit into the spit too and said, amen, preacher, it's a sin. It's a sin to smoke them cigars. And she chewed, she spit, amen, preacher, it's a sin to burn anything that tastes this good. <laughs> Please don't bring your spittoon to church. <laughs> and whoever clips her toenails over there somewhere on Sundays, could you... My wife's a janitor. There are things that you have to pick up around here. Verse 6 could easily be another category. Verse 6 could be another. Don't give to the dogs with sacred and don't cast your pearls before pigs. This analogy was used by Christ to demonstrate how people whose minds have not been opened by God to understand his truth react when they hear spiritual knowledge. Some, when they hear the gospel, they mock and they criticize. They make fun of Christianity. They make fun of Christians. They make fun of Christ. They view Christianity as some other fake religion and Jesus as some make-believe character. They don't want the gospel because they don't see any need for it. You'll never convince someone like that. You'll never win anybody like that. They will take the gospel you offer them and trample it under their feet. Jesus said in John 6, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him. You need to understand what it means to come to the Lord for salvation. You can't come to God until the Spirit begins to draw you. And how do you know that? You get hungry. You get hungry for the things of the Spirit. All of a sudden, your life doesn't satisfy you anymore, and you go searching for something. You don't know what it is, but you kind of know where to go get it. And the Spirit starts drawing you in. Jesus was instructing his disciples to not go about trying to convert the masses. You can't convert the whole world at once because the whole world isn't ready to be converted. Not everybody is being drawn by the Holy Spirit. Unless God is opening someone's mind to spiritual understanding, they will treat God's truth in the same manner that a pig would treat a string of pearls. They treat it like it was dirt. A pig would neither understand or appreciate the great beauty and the great worth of pearls, and neither would a person not being called by God understand the great value of the truths of God. He would figuratively trample it under his feet and then turn on you. We should never try to force God's truths on other people. Instead, we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness, and with fear. As Christians, we should be prepared to answer questions that other people might have if they're sincerely seeking. And not for the purpose of debating. You'll never win anybody to the Lord in a debate. Often when people honestly desire to understand what the Bible teaches, it can be an indication that God's opening that person's mind and the Holy Spirit is drawing them to him. They are beginning to ask about Christ. That's the open door. 
In Matthew 13, Jesus once again compares the truths of God to pearls. This account states, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Like the merchant who sold all that he had to purchase a pearl of great price, God expects us to treat his truth as valuable and as priceless as a gem. Verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. Though there seems evidently a climax here, expressive of more and more uh, opportunity, yet each of these terms used presents what we desire of God in a little bit different light. We ask for what we wish. We seek for what we miss. And we knock for that from which we feel ourselves shut out. Answering to this threefold representation is the triple assurance of success to our prayer of faith. But some people would say, well, I can't persuade myself. Okay, God will do it if I have the faith when I ask him, but I can't persuade myself. I don't have the faith. So how will I ever receive what I'm asking God for? But to meet this, Jesus repeats this assurance that he's just given. He says, for everyone that asks, they'll receive. He that seeks will find, and to him that knocks, it will be open. Of course, it's presumed that we ask for the right things and in the right way, with an honest purpose to make use of what we receive for the glory of God. James says in James 1, 5 to 7, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. And then Jane continues to say, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you might consume it on your own lusts. He said, what man is there of you whom if his son asks for bread, if he asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? What father would give his hungry child a round, smooth rock that appears to be a cake or a loaf? That wouldn't be very funny, especially if his son was starving. Or if he asked for a fish, would he give him a serpent? What kind of a sick individual would give his hungry child a deadly snake instead of a fillet to fill his stomach? He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Bad as our fallen nature is, the Father in us is still father-ish. You know what that means? You're still father-ish. We want what's best for our children, and we want to do all that we can for them. We want to meet their needs, and we want to fulfill their desires. What a heart, then, must be the father of all fathers have toward his children. In the corresponding passage in Luke, he speaks the same story, only in a little different light, where Matthew says he will give good things. In Luke, uh, he says whether he will not much more give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him which is the consummation of all good things. And then we get down to verse 12. Verse 12 is what has been known as the golden rule. Everybody hear the golden rule? You've heard the golden rule? Yeah, you did back when I was in grade school 100 years ago. We don't hear much about it anymore. He says, therefore, saying it all in one word, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. Now, I know some people misquote that, do unto others before they do it to you. But that's not what it says. He's saying treat other people like you want other people to treat you. The same thing and in the same way. He said, because this is the law and the prophets. This is the substance of all relative duty. It's all Scripture in a nutshell. It's called the royal law, reflecting what is said in James chapter 2 and verse 8 and Romans 13, 9. Love your neighbor as yourself. God doesn't tell us to love ourselves. We already do that. We live in a world that tells us to love ourselves. Oh, you just have low self-esteem. You just don't love yourself. But what we find in the scriptures is that the love that we have for ourselves corresponds to the love that we have for God and have for other people. The fact isn't that we have low self-esteem. The fact is that we esteem God low and we esteem other people low. We start loving God more and we start loving other people more. We're going to love ourselves more. The world gets it all backwards. It is true that similar maxims are found in the writings of the Greeks and the Romans. 
The precise sense of the maxim is, is best referred to as just common sense. We should wish that men would do to us what we do to them. It's only reasonable that they should do to us the same that we are to do to them. These are Jesus' words. Treat other people like you want other people to treat you. Makes sense. Verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In these words concerning the broad and narrow way, Jesus seems to allude to the rules of the Jews among their lawyers concerning public and private entrances. You ever been somewhere that has the public entrance and then it has the private entrance for you know, special people? Special people? A private way or a private entrance was four cubits wide while a public way was 16 cubits wide, four times as big. Select people entered through the private gate, which was narrow. But the rest of the public entered through the wide gate. The narrow gate he calls the straight gate, and there's there, there are three things about it I want to point out. First of all, Jesus says this is the gate that leads to life. Obviously, what he means here is this is the gate that leads men to God, the gate that leads men to heaven. Second of all, Jesus says that it is a straight gate. The word straight means difficult. Jesus tells us that entering heaven is not easy. This is a surprise to a lot of people because they've been taught that the way to heaven is easy. They've been taught that all you have to do is to be saved is believe in Jesus. All you have to do is kneel at an altar, say a little prayer, attend church every now and then. There, there's a great difference between what some believe now and what Jesus taught here. Third, Jesus tells us that there are not many people going in through this straight gate in their own way. He says, few there be that find it. This is also a surprise to many because they believe that most people will be saved and most people believe in God. If you look at the way our world operates, when anybody dies, everybody talks about they're going to heaven, no matter who they are, how they've lived, or what they believed. Let's put this into perspective. This seems to mean that there will be more people in hell than there will be in heaven. That's a sobering thought. It's sobering to think that in our world there will be more people who will die and end up in hell than there will be those who die and go to heaven. In our community, there will be more people in hell than in heaven. Hopefully those words don't translate to your own families or to the church. Jesus told us three things about that straight gate. The gate is the gate that leads to heaven. It's difficult to enter, and there won't be many people who go in that straight gate. So far, we don't have any trouble understanding what Jesus has said. While it might, we may not agree with what most of us have been taught or what most of us believe, it's very clear and it's easy to understand. These are Jesus' words. You want to know God's opinion? That's it. Now let's consider the wide gate. First of all, he says it's a wide gate. It's a gate that's easily seen. It might even be a gate that's attractive and alluring. It captures people's attention and it draws people to see it. Second of all, Jesus tells us that this gate is the entrance to a broad way. Some translations say it is the easy way. If there's one thing that we learn from life is that the easy way is not always the right way, and it certainly isn't always the best way. But he says this gate's wide. In other words, it's not hard to enter this gate or to walk the road that it opens to. It's an easy place to pass through. Third, Jesus tells us that this gate leads to hell. Those who go in that gate are bound for destruction. There are no exits or no other way out. Fourth, Jesus told us there are going to be many who go through this gate. Remember, there are only going to be a few who go in the narrow gate to heaven, but many will go into the gate to hell. Many. Why is that? Many. Why is that? Do they want to go to hell? I don't think so. Is, is, is that their heart's desire? They don't want heaven? They don't want to spend eternity with the Lord? Or have they not taken seriously enough the things as God has said and have just taken the easy way out? Verse 15, 
Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. It's no surprise that Jesus follows his words on the two gates with the disposition about false prophets. Not only is there a wide and attractive gate that leads to hell, there are also false prophets in this world advertising and tempting people to pass through that gate. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, said, Nothing so much prevents men from entering the straight gate and becoming true followers of Christ as the carnal, soothing, flattering doctrines of those who oppose the truth. Think about this in the context of our own community. What do the churches in our county teach is necessary to salvation? If you think of the many churches that we have in all of our county and, and the many different backgrounds, the labels on the sign and the labels above the door, what do the churches in our county teach that is necessary to salvation? Well, some of the churches teach that salvation is by the blood of Jesus Christ through faith and repentance of our sin, just exactly as Jesus taught it. But there are some that teach that salvation comes through church membership or it comes through just being a good person or being a religious person, and that'll be enough. Some teach that salvation can only be found in the rites and rituals of their specific church and nowhere else. And they mock what Christ did on the cross by re-crucifying him every time they have a service. How many people are being enticed to enter through the wide gate? How many people will be deceived into entering hell for eternity? But the bigger question, Jesus says, is what can we do about it? What are we doing about it? Jesus specifically commands us to be fruit inspectors. We can't be naive. We, we can't be politically correct. We can't embrace everybody in their own version of the truth. But we have to discern between the true prophets and the false prophets, between the teachers of the truth and the bearers of lies. And we must warn those who are being deceived by them and led toward destruction. Jesus said, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. You just can't sit back and allow somebody to be lied to that's going to lead them through that wide gate down to hell without doing anything about it. You say, but you know, people get mad at me. They'll call me names. They, it'll, it'll hurt a friendship. Let me tell you what's going to hurt your friendship is if your friend stands before the judgment of the Lord and Jesus says, sorry, I never knew you. Depart from me. And they look back at you and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? Jesus told us to discern them by their fruit. There is good fruit and there is bad fruit. There's the fruit of the Spirit and there are the works of the flesh. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But the works of the flesh is fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, wraths, factions, divisions, parties, envyings, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Pretty easy to tell one from the other. I don't think any of us, I don't think any one of us is so ignorant that we can't discern one from the other. There are people being led to hell, and we are obligated to do something about it. Then there's the solemn warning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. They prophesied, they preached, they stood up against the devil and they performed the miraculous, but they were never truly saved. They looked like it, they acted like it, but they never had a real relationship with God. And Jesus said, I never knew you. 
Imagine what it will be like to one day stand before the judgment of God thinking that you are a Christian. Now, I want you to get this, church, because I, I'm concerned about you. you. You're my congregation, okay? I don't want anybody in my congregation to miss heaven. I don't want every, anybody in my congregation to get it wrong. I don't want you to think that you're a Christian when you're not really a Christian. I don't want you to think that, that you've done all you need to do when you haven't done nearly enough. I, I, I don't want you to be deceived in any way, shape, or form. I want you to know the truth. I, I tell you the truth. I, I try to explain to you the truth. Sometimes you receive it, sometimes you don't. But I don't want you to miss heaven if I can help it. Imagine what it would be like to one day stand before the judgment of God, thinking that you're a Christian. You've attended church. You've been a decent person. You got away from the world. And you're excited that you are about to enter eternity in heaven. But then Jesus looks at you, and he says, Depart from me. I never knew you. Certainly nobody wants to take that chance. And hopefully we don't want other people to risk it either. Hopefully Jesus' words will inspire us to work and to give and to help and to witness so that no one will have to hear those words. That's why we work as hard as we do around here. That's why we take on the extra jobs of writing Bible schools and writing journeys through time and, and doing all of those extra things because we want to explain to everybody we possibly can the message of the gospel. We want people to get it right. There's going to be a lot of religious people in hell. There's going to be a lot of church members in hell because they've never truly committed their life to the Lord. One thing I, I hope you get in this journey through time is, is what we do over there in the fellowship hall. When we do the explanation of what goes on in the tabernacle and how to get to God, I hope you get it. We, I rewrote it again this year. We redid it because I, I really want to make sure that nobody misses this message. Church, we need to be work harder than we've ever worked before. We need to get serious about winning other people into the kingdom of God. We need to stop being so fleshly and so carnal and so selfish and live like children of God, seeking him and his kingdom first in our life, first ahead of everything else. Nothing is more important. I give everything I have for the kingdom of God and have no regrets. Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus closes his sermon by saying, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Everybody who hears this sermon and lives by it is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Construction begins underground. Construction begins with the foundation. I've been informed that this new church that we're going to build out here will have $600,000 worth of work done underground before anything is ever built above the ground. Well, that sounds like a waste, doesn't it? Nobody's even going to see it. But everything that we put above ground on what we do below ground, is going to last depending on how good of a job we do with what we put under the ground. If the foundation is bad, it doesn't matter how expensive the rest of the building is, it won't stand up to the elements. Jesus promises that the rains will come. 
The rains will come, the flood waters will rise, and the winds will blow. Every house will be tested, but those built on the rock will not fall. You want to know where somebody's life is built and what it's built upon? Look at the people that's been through the storms of life that are still true to the Lord. We'll all be tested. You can't get through this life without being tested. Everybody's going to get tested. At some point in your life, the hedge is going to drop around you. At some point in your life, you're going to walk into a hospital and maybe not walk out. At some point in your life, you're going to walk in, into a funeral home and then out to a graveyard. At some point in your life, the hedge will fall. The rain's going to fall. The floodwaters are going to rise, and the wind is going to be blowed, uh, blow, and, and your house is going to be tested. We'll all be tested. You can't get through life without being tested. But not everybody will have built their life on Christ. Some will build on sand. They'll build on their own ideas and, 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 and their own agendas and their own will and their own desires. And likewise, those rains will come and the floodwaters will rise and the winds will blow and the house built upon the sand will fall. It will fall with a great, devastating crash. Verse 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not like their teachers of the law. When Jesus finished speaking, they were all amazed at his teachings because he taught as somebody with authority. Not like the people that they were used to hearing teach. In other words, Jesus wasn't teaching a system that had been handed down and taught to him but he, Jesus spoke like he was the author. Like he was the author. Jesus is the author. He is the authority. We have to do what he says and live like he tells us to live. There is no other way. Read his sermon. Read these three chapters. And then when you're all done, read them again. And read them again. I don't care if you don't read through the whole Bible in a year. If you just read these three chapters this year, you'll be a better person for doing it. There's no other way. There's no other way. Make yourself so familiar <coughs> excuse me, with this Sermon on the Mount that it becomes a natural part of who you are. I've learned some things in these last few weeks. I don't know about you, but I've learned some things. I've learned I don't necessarily want to be blessed all the time. <coughs> but there's sometimes when I think I'm not blessed, I am blessed because Jesus says so. I've learned that I need to be effective all of the time. Whether it's a good effect or a bad effect, I need to have some effect because if I've lost my effectiveness in the world I'm living in, I'm worthless to the kingdom of God. I've learned how to live with the law and the laws of the land and the laws of the Lord. I've learned what God has to say about relationships and about divorce, what God has to say about me uh, swearing an oath or, or taking his name in vain. I've learned what God has to say about how to treat other people and what is fair. I, I've learned that God's told me that I need to love my enemies, that I need to give to those who have need. I've, I've learned how to pray. I've learned how to fast. I've learned to lay my treasures up in heaven instead of down here. I've learned not to worry because God has everything under control. I've learned that it's all right to look at somebody and know that they've done wrong, but it's wrong for me without knowing all of the facts to pronounce judgment, and I need to be slow in my judgment because God's going to judge me the same way. I've learned that whatever I ask for, whatever I seek, whatever, whatever door I knock on, if I'm doing it for the glory of God, God is going to give me those things that I ask for. I've learned that the way to heaven is hard. It's not easy, and the way to hell is too simple. I've learned that there are false prophets out here who really don't care about the souls of men, but their objective is to see how many people that they can lead astray. I've learned that my life has to be built on Christ if it's ever going to stand. Storms are going to come to all of us, and if we're going to make it, we have to make it with him. He's the authority. These are his words. If you want to know what God expects from you, 
is a Christian. Become an expert on the Sermon on the Mount. Father, I thank you for the things you've taught us. And God, I know that we didn't grasp it all. God, we never seemed to grasp it all. But God, we got some of it. And God, I pray you'll help us to get enough hunger that we go back and we get more. This is how you want us to live. And God, someday we're going to stand before you and you're going to open it up and you're going to say, all right, I've already told you, how did you do? And God, we're going to have to come up with an answer. Father, I want you to be first in absolutely everything I do. Everything. I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to make a decision that someday I'm going to have to give account for. I don't want to make the wrong choices. I don't want to make selfish choices. I want to give my all. Everything. So the Lord, when I stand in your presence, you look at me and you'll say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. That's the payment. That's good enough. That's better than I deserve. Father, might we become experts upon the Sermon on the Mount. We want to know how to live. Right there it is. God, help us to do it. Help us to do it. So that you could be glorified. And God, we could have added to our life all of those other things that we've always worried about because you're God. Father, dismiss us tonight with your blessing. Bring us back together on Sunday. God, between now and then, there's a lot of things going on. We have trips and we have work happening and, and God, ministry. And God, we pray you just be a part of all of that. God, as we bring everybody back into your house on Sunday morning, God, make it a special time. God, a time when we put spiritual things first so you'll be pleased in Jesus name thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio to find out more information about Free Christian Church of God or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program Your Life call the church office at area code 419 596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.